the entire oral cavity is an extremely important component of general bodily health. Let's talk about how cavities form, because I think this is the major question that people ask when asking about or thinking about oral health. Cavities are literally holes. They make it down to the dentin layer of the tooth, most likely do need to be drilled and filled. Your goal, I think all of our goal, is to try and keep our teeth in a state of remineralization by keeping the pH, that is the relative acid alkaline balance of the mouth, such that the saliva supports remineralization. Turns out that no specific food, not even sugar, causes cavities. Cavities are not caused by sugar. Cavities are caused by bacteria that feed on sugar, that then produce acid that burrows down through, that degrades, that demineralizes the tooth in this very focal area that we call a cavity. The bacteria that causes cavities by eating sugar and releasing this acid while there are several of them, the major one is called streptococcus mutans, or what I'll call strep mutans for short. Strep mutans is not something you're born with. It's actually a communicable bacteria. That's right, you give it to one another. Most people in the world have strep mutans or will get strep mutans, and it lives in the mouth. When there's sugar present, it eats it, it produces acid, the acid produces cavities, taking teeth from a state of remineralization to demineralization, or, and by the way, this is really important, if your mouth is already in a state that's more demineralization mode, so to speak, well then it will capitalize on that and it will cause cavities much faster, okay? So keep in mind that acidity is bad for the mouth. Does that mean that you should never consume a lemon or carbonated drinks? or sodas, or tea, or anything that has acidic flavor? No. Turns out strep mutans like sugars in the form of complex carbohydrate sugars too. Does that mean that if you were to have a zero carbohydrate diet, no sugars, no starches, etc., you would reduce the opportunity for strep mutans to consume sugar and release acid? Maybe, maybe. However, most people won't do that. And strep mutans is a very clever, maybe even diabolical bacteria. And if you are on a zero carbohydrate, zero sugar diet, there's some evidence that strep mutans will figure out ways to feed on other components of food in order to create this acid to then create cavities in your teeth. So the key thing to understand here is that cavities form not from foods, not from sugars per se, but from strep mutans and other bacteria that eat those sugars and create acid. The key is to try and reduce the amount of strep mutans and reduce the amount of acid in the mouth. Those minerals that form the crystals within the enamel and some of the deeper layers of your tooth, those crystals form through a specific type of bond and those bonds are very strong. They're not indestructible, but they're tough to pull apart. And the naturally occurring mineral that's responsible for the majority of these bonds in the enamel and teeth is called hydroxyapatite. Fluoride is a substance that is not a vitamin, it's not a mineral, it is not an essential nutrient, can actually replace some of the hydroxyapatite bonds in teeth and actually make those bonds hyper strong, super physiologically strong. After you eat anything, it's a good idea to try and clear as much of that food product from your mouth. The vast majority of dentists out there all say the same thing. You need to brush, you need to floss, you need to do it twice a day or more, and you need to do it correctly. So now let's talk about what correct brushing and flossing really is. Use a soft toothbrush. A very vigorous brushing with medium or hard, as they're called, bristles, really disrupts the interface between the teeth and the gums in ways that's not healthy for the gums and actually makes tenting of the gums and those pockets, those recesses, as they're called, far more likely to form. If you are regular with your brushing, and especially if you're brushing and flossing regularly, that a soft toothbrush is going to be the best way to break up that biofilm layer each and every time and promote the best tooth and overall oral health. It was also suggested that people brush their gums. This is interesting. For people out there who have tooth sensitivity, 
One of the major suggestions from people in the dental and periodontal field, at least the ones I spoke to, was to actually brush your gums lightly to increase circulation of blood and other nutrients to the deeper portions of the tooth that actually extend into the bone. You need to floss correctly. You can't just pull the floss down onto the gum in between the tooth. You need to glide down the side of the tooth, get a little bit underneath the gum, and use a circular motion, and then lift up from between the two teeth. Most all mouthwashes, especially those containing alcohol, are terrible for oral health. Simply put, they deplete certain components of the mucosal lining of the mouth, and they disrupt the healthy components of the oral microbiome. In addition, there are antiseptic mouthwashes, some of which contain alcohol, some of which don't. Most people, however, are using mouthwashes to freshen their breath and to kill off additional bacteria in the mouth that they might believe they couldn't get with brushing or flossing. If you are somebody who really wants to use a mouthwash for that reason, I encourage you to try and find a mouthwash that is not alcohol-based and that is not a strong antiseptic, or that if it is an antiseptic, that it's not alcohol-based. I talked to several dentists and they told me that baking soda actually is fairly low on the abrasiveness rating scale. They have a specific rating scale for this that we don't have to go into, but it's actually considered quite safe for the enamel of the teeth, especially if you're brushing with a soft toothbrush and you're not like really grinding the stuff against your teeth. It turns out that baking soda and water is actually a pretty good toothpaste if you're not going to go buy a toothpaste. It's pretty clear that hydrogen peroxide unless there's a specific medical recommendation to do so, is not something you want to introduce to the oral cavity. It does seem that creating a high salt solution, okay, so taking some salt, putting it into water, dissolving it, and then finding the point at which it won't quite dissolve because the concentration of sodium is just high enough, and using that as, of course, not something to swallow, but rather as a dental rinse, so putting your mouth and swishing it around, and then spitting it out, and it's gonna taste very salty. And then taking a swig of water, you know, just plain water and then swishing it around and then spitting it out. That actually provides a really nice milieu for the production of healthy mouth bacteria. But again, I wanna be very clear, do not, do not swallow high salt concentration fluid. We're talking about a swish and then a spitting it out. Xylitol is a very low calorie sweetener. I can place it among the other low calorie sweeteners like aspartame, sucralose, stevia, etc. The bacteria Streptococcus mutans loves to eat xylitol, but when Streptococcus mutans eats xylitol, it doesn't, meaning it cannot produce the acid that normally would demineralize the teeth and create cavities. In addition to that, when Streptococcus mutans eats xylitol, it kills Streptococcus mutans. Because xylitol can actually inhibit the growth, and that is the proliferation of more strep mutans, we've got a twofer. We've got a situation where strep mutans can't release acid to demineralize the teeth and potentially cause cavities, and the total amount of strep mutans that can grow, that can proliferate in what are called colonies. Literally, the bacteria colonizes on the teeth in that forming that biofilm. Well, then that can't happen. To just go back to the larger point of whether or not you should get cavities filled, whether or not you need that root canal, that was a very common question. A lot of people said, do we really need root canals? Do we really need to drill cavities? You know, my observation, based on now having talked to a number of different practitioners in this space, who really pay a lot of attention to the peer-reviewed research, the old school practices, the new practices and where everything is headed, is that, you know, there are indeed instances where people need root canals. There are many cavities that are just too deep into the teeth that remineralization of the teeth through the sorts of protocols that we're talking about today is not going to cut it, that they really need to be drilled and filled. Do we really need to go to the dentist twice a year, every six months? That's the general recommendation. Now, what was really great is that the feedback I got from dentists was very balanced. Here's what the consensus was. This business of going to the dentist twice a year makes sense. 
It makes sense from the perspective of quote unquote routine cleanings, but everyone acknowledged that those routine cleanings, while they can remove tartar that's built up, that would be very, very difficult for people to reverse or eliminate at home. And while they can identify cavities and tell you how far a cavity has developed into the tooth, et cetera, every one of those dentists agreed that those routine cleanings are not actually going to help remineralize your teeth, except to the extent that they remove existing bacteria, plaque, and tartar. And so all of them said that they wish for and that they really strive in their own practices to promote more oral health daily protocols of the sort that we've talked about today, which I think is just great.